Pacific and extraterrestrial. Uh, Paul is Vice President of Life Sciences and Genetics at the John Templeton Foundation, where he develops new research initiatives on the fundamental nature and the evolution of life and mind, especially as they intersect with meaning and purpose. Prior to joining the Templeton Foundation, he was Director of Foundations and Corporations at Bates College. In the Archaeology of Rank, in 1994, Dr. Watson, uh, Watson examines social evolution, inequality, yeah. and archaeological theory. Thank you. Yeah. Well, I see that um, people are setting this up nicely. They brought in some coffee just in time to wake you up again. And I put on my sport coat so you'll believe me and uh, we'll be all set. Is it possible that insights earned through the practice of archaeology might prove useful um, in creating communications with extraterrestrial intelligences? I'm upside down here. The differences between the respective goals might simply overwhelm what these projects have in common, rendering my few suggestions uh, either banal or virtually impossible to operationalize. But I think there's at least a few analogies. Uh, in particular, the extent to which um, archaeology uncovers evidence of intelligence as a phenomenon in itself, and not just human intelligence. Um, as in the article on which this presentation is based, I offer a series of vignettes of archaeological work to illustrate some promising avenues and difficult issues. Um, archaeology might potentially contribute in other ways, for example, concerning the kinds of content that might, with brevity, um, give others the most insight into ourselves. Um, and that's something hotly debated. But here I concentrate on how to increase the possibility of being understood uh, by considering the ways in which we've misunderstood the messages coming to us from our own species in the past. Uh, finally, I've added some thoughts from another article on how Neolithic uh, monuments communicate with us today. And I'll start with that one. Marshall McLuhan's famous statement, the medium is the message, is stark, provocative, and simplistic, as its birth in the 60s um, befits. But there's also something almost true about it. For the medium of communication and the messages are um, always deeply intertwined. Ancient monuments, um, I'm doing, there we go. Ancient monuments communicate through three different ways, um, or I mean, probably a number of ways, but I've sort of lumped them into um, three categories to, to separate them out. First, uh, the subtext. Because of our inferential methods, monuments communicate a great deal to us beyond what the builders intended to communicate. Uh, concepts like culture, social structure, chiefdom, ritual, these are all grow out of um, modern social science. And probably people in the past didn't think of themselves and their societies in these terms, and, and perhaps neither would um, people on another planet. Archaeological method is our way of translating the traces of intellectual activity of the past into these modern categories. One example being um, the inference of leadership, monumental construction, on the scale of, say, an Avery or a Stonehenge um, would take so many workers that they surely would have had to have been carefully coordinated. Therefore, the monumental scale as a fact in itself tells us these were non-egalitarian societies with some kind of leadership system. This we can learn about them um, through study of the artifacts itself. Now, it's true that uh, not all not all archaeologists have agreed with this. Ian Hodder, for example, in the 90s, um, argued that all of archaeology is based on assumptions about what things meant, whether we recognize it or not. Um, it is only when we make assumptions about subjective meanings in the minds of people long dead that we begin to do archaeology, he said. In, w in one sense, this is probably true, but um, 
In another sense, the inference of ranking does not depend on knowing what people intended by building the monuments. Certainly, it assumes certain things about humans, our size and strength, for example, that we would not share with people on another, individuals on another planet, but um, we don't need to know their intentions. Second kind of communication is the monumental messages. Um, the, the, what was intentionally communicated. Here, archaeologists have the most trouble, actually, uh, even though these are fellow Homo sapiens from only four to 5,000 years ago. We often avoid the question of why prehistoric people built these things and what kind of rituals or practices they, they did there, which unfortunately has the side effect of leaving it open to all manner of fringe speculation. And this is where archaeologists probably have the same uh, experience as um, uh, SETI scholars do when you sit on a, a plane and someone spins out their theory about how the aliens made Stonehenge and, and that sort of thing. Third, um, monuments as the medium. How do the monuments serve as vehicles for communication? Those I've been discussing are ceremonial monuments, a medium for religious communication. Ceremonies had been held in the Avery and Stonehenge region of England for two previous millennia in or near long barrows, um, which can accommodate only a few people at a time. So we might be able to infer, again without knowing what was in their heads, that um, there was some kind of transition in the nature of the religion such that um, from, from a shamanic religion, for example, in which ceremonies had a, a few participants located in liminal spaces, to a situation in, when, in which the rituals and beliefs called for full-time specialists and large group uh, gatherings. This is not the message anyone was sending, but it comes from uh, the medium. Uh, another example um, is from when our archaeological work has not really succeeded. In fact, often, uh, even worse, it's not always possible to tell whether on, we're on the right track or not. Uh, consider the study of Paleolithic cave art of southern Europe. Many theories have been offered concerning what this is all about, from hunting magic to shamanism. It's even been suggested that the Venus figurines were a kind of primitive pornography. I'm not making this up. Um, but there's no agreement at this point, which raises the question, what hope would uh, extraterrestrial intelligences have of understanding our communications if we have such a hard time understanding, again, the communications of fully modern members of our species? Um, but it's not so bleak, uh, especially if we consider the issue of levels of detail and understanding. I think this is something that's sometimes left out of these conversations. True, it's likely that we would <coughs> it's uh, likely there are things we may never learn about Paleolithic cave art at the most detailed level. Um, and I would agree with Clifford Gertz, who characterizes art as a local matter, acceptable, uh, accessible, so to speak, only by cultural insiders. Uh, I think of Leonardo da Vinci's Last Supper, a painting that has rather little to do with a group of hungry men. But what chance would someone unfamiliar with Christianity have of knowing what it was really saying? Um, however, I think the local knowledge caution has its limits. Uh, yes, we miss a great deal if we don't understand, in this case, Christian theology, but that local knowledge should not be needed for a viewer to see that there's something special going on. Not to mention what might be learned from the subtext about earthly beings and clothing of the Renaissance. With Paleolithic art as well, our frustrations have mostly to do with the content, the specific details of the message being communicated. We can still learn quite a bit about it through the um, medium and the subtext. Next case uh, concerns the matter of ethnographic analogy. Um, ethnographic analogy is the use of what we already know about human material culture to interpret um, what we find in archaeological contexts. Most useful for prehistorians has been analogy with traditional peoples around the world. But of course, we draw analogies with our own individual thinking as well, although somewhat less systematically, because we just um, sort of assume everybody is alike. Now, there are records from the 16th century of people trying to explain why certain rocks differed that we would now call stone tools 
uh, differed from others. They were, they were widely referred to as fairy arrows or elf shot, or by those less given to specifying a cause in terms of personal agency as thunderbolts. The thunderbolt idea is an attempt to explain the formation of these stones in thunderclouds, as it happens by mechanical processes that are now recognized as just as imaginary as uh, fairies and elves. Eventually, they were recognized as tools the evidence being an analogy with similar tools in use at the time by Native Americans. This does not appear to be good news for SETI, that it could require a specific analogy with known cultures to interpret these rocks correctly as products of intelligent beings. But again, um, even those who did not recognize them as tools agreed there was something about them in need of explanation. So there's, uh, it's not an all or nothing situation. Following from, from the ethnographic analogy, which is a form of creating a context, um, consider um, in other ways the intellectual and the physical contexts and how they're used in archaeology. Um, the strengths and weaknesses of ethnographic analogy both grow in part from how difficult it is to know what we do not know. Ethnography expands our vision of what is humanly possible, but cannot expand our vision much further than that. It's likely enough that even in the Paleolithic, there were social forms of life um, not represented among historically known peoples, never mind what may exist on a distant planet. This is important, I think, for um, while no one is proposing that we use ethnographic studies of traditional human societies for understanding extraterrestrials, I expect we will find it hard to refrain from pre-consciously drawing analogies with ourselves in the creation of SETI communications. I, for one, find it very easy to start a thought with any intelligent being would and end that thought with what I would do. Um, and I think I'm not alone in this. Uh, now, that may not be completely wrong. It could be that I actually do things that any intelligent being would do. Um, but it does require great care. Our intellectual culture frees us to explore new ideas and disciplines in creative ways, but at the same time constrains our search to what we are predisposed to believing is possible. Uh, one example from archaeology follows directly from the last. While the idea that these stones were tools, on analogy with other cultures, uh, became widely accepted, people for some time thought of them as much more recent than current dating places them. Their true nature, so to speak, could not be recognized as they simply did not fit into what everyone knew to be the true chronology of our species. Physical context is, if anything, even more important. What turned the tide in European scholarly appreciation of the length of human antiquity was the physical context, specifically tools found undisturbed in sediments or in clear association with remains of extinct mammals. And this is a particularly, um, the picture there is a particularly good one. It's a drawing of a mammoth on a mammoth bone, um, which suggests um, some knowledge of the connection and, and is, I mean, now we're not, we're not concerned with the question. We know very well humans lived at the time of mammoths, but that kind of thing was what helped, that kind of context was what helped convince people. Physical context is central to all archaeological work, and this at several levels. This includes the context created by previous finds. Context in this sense flood our meager data with all manner of associations and additional conclusions that flesh them out into a picture of human activity. When I find a broken projectile point in my garden in Pennsylvania, I receive a message from the past that is rich, deep, and easy to read. My mind is filled with images of woodland longhouses, with smoke curling lazily into the blue sky, a group of men returning with deer from a hunt, Chil children and dogs playing around. Now the tool does not in itself tell me this, but it's because of the context of the previous finds. And so the tool might have its own little message, but the richness of the message is very dependent on the context of prior knowledge. An existing web of interrelated empirical knowledge can render the same idea more or less plausible. Um, now, this has worked somewhat in, in favor of appreciation for astrobiology um, and probably SETI over the years um, because the intellectual context of the scientific community has changed. 
For instance, um, astrobiology has been rendered more interesting by the discovery in recent decades of a wide range of extremophiles on Earth, suggesting that life could um, exist in a much wider set of environments than previously. And um, <coughs> the, the um, discovery of exoplanets, of course, um, has um, helped that as well. The next has to do with symbolism. Um, the study of symboling is important in the archaeological inference of intelligence, if nothing else, for the obvious reason that producing symbols is a behavior requiring intelligence. But one problem is that symbols can and often do have an arbitrary, or at least a conventional rather than a conceptual, relationship to what they symbolize. It might seem then that symbolism and communication of ideas routinely expressed in complex symbolism would be the worst way to go in constructing messages. But this is not easily avoided. Whatever the message we send needs to be communicated in some medium uh, and will probably of necessity be symbolic. On the other hand, while the relationship of symbol to reference is arbitrary, it's not necessarily random. Indeed, when it comes in the form of language, symboling is very systematic. And this makes, potentially makes, deciphering a message easier. easier. Writing has the advantage of representing a very systematic set of symbols, yet it has the disadvantage that, in effect, it's a symbol system representing another symbol system, the language itself, uh, representing the ideas. It's long been noted that no ancient script has ever been deciphered when we did not know the language it was written in. Uh, I, I had a chance to go to Nosos just a couple of weeks ago and saw a Linear B tablet for the first time. That's why I, I uh, tried to stay on task, but I had to include that. If we send, can send at least part of our communications using only one layer of symbolism, this would make it much easier to read. It would be a kind of foot in the door. In fact, it could make all the difference. I'm not sure if this is possible, because I, I don't understand um, the, uh, the technologies involved. But um, there would also be some disadvantages, such that it would make the subject matter more difficult to specify than when using languages. Um, I said, so are there ways of avoiding sending messages requiring ETIs to work back through two layers of symboling? I suggest very briefly two possibilities, one being um, sending um, something equivalent to a, a, a Rosetta Stone. The Rosetta Stone was a key to um, hieroglyphics by having um, the same text written in uh, a language that Champion could read, and um, it, could, it was kind of the straw for him to grasp and make the connection with the way the hieroglyphics worked. Now, of course, um, this would be, it would be rather a lot to ask of a message to another planet, since there's nothing we could send that we know they could read. But perhaps we can make the step initial step a little easier by what we send. For instance, to send a message that starts off with information they are likely to know. And this is where I would agree with the, um, the people who suggest sending some basic scientific information. If, if the information, at least in the first some part of the message, is something that they're likely to know, they, just, they would be uh, more confident that they had gotten through deciphering the symbol systems. And um, sorry. finally, I would like to suggest this follows very nicely from the last presentation, um, that we communicate something about the ascetic, moral, or religious. This idea at first glance appears to be the opposite advice um, from sending the Rosetta Stone. But I think it's another example of sending information about something they perhaps already know. Archaeologically, it is evidence of symbolic activity, art in particular, that seems to reveal most about ancient humans and their thought. And while on the surface, ideas concerning matters ascetic, moral, religious, and poetic are things in which human cultures seem to vary the most, that is to say, where local knowledge is most essential for real, detailed understanding, at another level, these are also recognized as ways in which humans can most easily make connections with each other across cultures. Think of it in terms of this question. Is there anything we can think of that virtually anyone on Earth would understand, regardless of culture, regardless of what languages we do or do not speak? Um, I'm not questioning the uh, ETI's intelligence, but you might say I'm looking for a straw for them to grasp 
It might seem counterintuitive, especially to people like me, who never seem to get the point of poetry. Um, but at another level, the aesthetic, moral, and religious are much more universal than they seem. The point being easily illustrated, at least within the human uh, context, by um, the paintings of Lascaux or Altamira, which seem to um, evoke um, expressions of, of familiarity, even though they're 12,000 years old. And similarly, with Doug's efforts of a decade or so ago at constructing messages that convey the notion of altruism. Would ETIs understand? I'm not sure, but probably most humans would understand, and that's a, a good step in, in constructing messages. If, if we s construct messages that most humans wouldn't understand, um, that's potentially problematic. Now I have um, a series of um, conclusions, and they're essentially um, what, just a summary of what I just said. The first is um, the two reasons why deciphering a message might be difficult, uh, the two coding in two layers of symbolism and the question of details. And the second has to do with the great importance of context. And if there's some way that we can use the, um, the subtext and the medium um, to convey a message that, uh, con convey information that does, that's prior to them um, in deciphering the main message, I think that could be a helpful uh, thing to do. So thank you. Any questions for Paul? That must have been the clearest. <laughs> <laughs> I, I think I used three layers of symbolism there. And <laughs> yes. I think I read recently that um, there are similar styles of cave painting um, in Indonesia at a time that's coeval, but without communication apparently between Europe and, and Indonesia. So. Is that somehow saying that that style or that representational thing is, is universal? That's a great question. And it would be very, very hard to tell. Um, I think the fact that we react to cave paintings in, in ways that we don't understand exactly what they're saying, but on the other hand, we can sense that this is um, an, an expression of, of some aspect of human spirit might suggest there is something in common. I, I don't know about those examples, but it could be, of course, that people did travel around a lot. And the cave paintings in Europe, here's a, an interesting fact, as long as you brought it up. <laughs> um, the earliest cave paintings in Europe, um, they, they painted over uh, between 35,000 and 12,000 years. That means the earliest, by the time they painted the last cave paintings, more time had passed since the first ones than has passed since the last one. So it was a very long time period over a fairly large area. So it's possible that, that um, it was migrations as well. Yes, in, in the message, uh, the language that uh, Richard Early and I tried to c construct, we were thinking of the Rosetta Stone, for example, the properties of gases. Now that's one of one, that's the language of science or reality, let's say. And we have a description of that, of course, with the gas laws and so on. Presumably, the aliens would have theirs. And there we have three different messages in this, of three different languages of the same phenomenon and perhaps can understand each other. That was the idea. That makes sense to me. And I think because. Um, I mean, S Seth's talk has left me optimistic about doing all this because we're not as constrained uh, in, the, in the size of the message as I thought we were. So you, it's possible to send some things like that um, to help them um, uh, understand our symbol system, to decipher it. Now, probably we don't want to put a lot of effort into sending a message across the universe that tells people what we think they already know, except as a tool for sending something else as, as a later part of the message. Trying to think which sub-question to start with. <laughs> um, could you maybe clarify the comment you made that we uh, haven't been able to interpret a text 
without already knowing the language it's written in? Yes. Um, the, the, the recent decipherments of um, Mayan is fairly recent and Linear B is fairly recent. And uh, in the Mayan case, it was, um, it was the real, one, of the th one of the breakthrough was the realization that they were actually writing two different languages in different parts of the region, were using the same hieroglyphics for two different languages. And when they sorted that out, they could, and they knew one of the languages, they were able to decipher it. Linear B also was um, discovered that it was an archaic form of Greek that was the language it was written in. Linear A has not been deciphered yet. It looks a lot like Linear B, but it was probably in a language, people are assuming it's in a language that we don't know. And then just, sorry, one other question. Um, when you're looking at, at cave art, uh, which is obviously a 2D representation of 3D, or arguably 4D when you're talking about actions, things, um, are there standard strategies for making that translation from 3 or 4D down to 2D? Um, people have tried to work that out. Um, and well, I've, I, I don't think there's universal agreement on that. But um, one of the fascinating things about the Chauvet Cave um, was this, this um, the horses. I don't know if I, if I had them in there. Um, that someone, th someone is suggesting that's to, to give an image of motion. Um, other, other things that are very typical, standard, you'd say, would be to use the, the, sh the shape of the rock surface to help um, form the, the uh, animal. Any more questions? Yes, ma'am, one second. Thank you. So I worry a little bit about how the art gets represented um, my, I guess I have two questions. First is, so do you assume that the, the, the target civilizations will have the same sensory inputs that we do, making, say, a, a static um, visual image useful to them? Um, and then would you label it in an attempt to sort of build <laughs> a code for, com for further communication? Uh, that's two great questions. Um, I, I wasn't, um, I'm going to have to bow out of both of them though. I, I wasn't actually recommending using art. I was just using our interpretation of art as an example. But, but on the other hand, that might be a great way of avoiding the two levels of symbolism. But you're right, it does make some assumptions uh, about, um, uh, about how they look at things. And labeling, I, I, I would guess that, um, that that's probably something that would, would help the message throughout, is sort of you know, exp explanation points. <laughs> yeah, and I don't know what I would recommend. I mean, if you, if you label things and you get that Gava guy problem, if you put a, picture of, put a label on a picture of a, uh, an adult with a child, are you is the word that you mean adult, child, relationship, art, carry, you know, grow? What, what could it possibly be? It's, it gets really complicated. But I suppose with, with enough information, you could establish something if you did it over and over in slightly different ways. I'm not sure. That makes sense. Now, my first reaction would be to use the, the pictures to help explain the language. Yeah. Uh, but you could use it the other way, too, I guess. I've got uh, really an observation other than a question. It, uh, in, uh, in cave paintings, it's actually quite rare to see the depiction of a human being. And it interestingly clashes with uh, what Clara uh, was, was saying and, and what, what, was she, what she was showing about our attempts at communicating and our messages, which are in many cases focused on ourselves, on humans. That's just a comment. Well, that's, that's a great comment, and it, um, it raises a host of other questions. Now, 
I, I've heard one theory that that um, you find the art during the Neolithic to be um, focused more on humans. And the suggestion is that there's more of a self-consciousness about humans developing at that time. And that follows nicely from the fact that, that now humans are not just collecting things that are growing, but are intentionally growing um, th their own foods. But it's, it's, um, it, there's also the question of the actual depictions of figures turn out to be a small portion of the total of Paleolithic art. So there's a lot of uh, possibly symbolic representation. There's, you've seen the hand um, prints and so on. Now, that's not exactly representation of humans, but it is a connection with humans. So it's, it, it, that's one of the reasons, I think, why people are still arguing about what it means. Thank you very much. Oh, thank you.